please, Raghu, would you like to move on to your first case? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, I don't think I can change the slides from my end. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, we'll go on to the next. Alan's doing the yeah. driving. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, this is another reason very frequently seen in India for interrupting treatment. Uh, she's a, a 31 year old woman uh, who had uh, a diagnosis of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase in uh, early March uh, 2020, just about three years back, 400 milligrams once daily. She had pancytopenia for which imatinib was stopped for some time. Uh, we could restart it in uh, July 2020. Once again, the cytopenias uh, raised their hood and uh, we had, uh, she did use the medicine, but defaulted because of the uh, cytopenia. Uh, she now presents with generalized weakness uh, and CBP shows uh, a TLC. We have 30% blast in the peripheral smear uh, uh, and a flow cytometry is uh, uh, quite suggestive of a myeloid blast crisis. So she was started on dasatinib 100 milligrams per day. And once again, just like with uh, imatinib, she had cytopenia. Uh, she was irregular in using. We had to reduce the dose to 50 milligrams. Once again, she still had cytopenia. Once again, she was irregular with the uh, drug. And uh, from November 21, uh, we changed over to bosotinib. Uh, even with bosotinib, she had cytopenia. And uh, a marrow aspiration and biopsy was done, which is suggestive of uh, a persistence of blast crisis with secondary myelofibrosis. Uh, in uh, May 2022, that's uh, last year, and the BCR level was 7.793, and the kinase domain mutation was negative for a, a, a Irma, and bosotinib was decreased uh, uh, to 300 milligrams, which she used till December last year. Uh, she's not even tolerating the 300 milligram reduced dose of bosotinib, so we put her now on nilotinib. 200 milligrams once a day, uh, quite a low dose, with a plan of escalating the dose uh, based upon her tolerance. So here is one patient who is not tolerating uh, anything because of cytopenia, uh, imatinib, uh, uh, dasatinib, uh, uh, bosatinib, then uh, uh, nilotinib. So... Uh, how commonly do we see TK cytopenias caused by TKIs? Uh, and what's the best way of managing this case further? And uh, is there anything like a minimal dose of TKI, like a pediatric dose or what we call a homeopathic dose of TKI, which can be used in this patient? I have a couple of patients who had refused to change their medication from 200 milligrams for the past 12 years. They are still in... Uh, uh, molecular remission uh, and considering poor compliance because of cytopenia as well as a poor response. Mind you, this lady is in persistent uh, blast crisis. What's the best way to get a response in case we want to proceed with a marrow transplant? I know some of these questions could be similar to the previous case as well, uh, but uh, uh, it is not as if uh, there was no effective drug, but the effectiveness was compromised because of the cytopenia. Over to the experts or to the anyone from the audience, please. Mari, would you like to start this time? Okay, so I think when patients are newly diagnosed and they start their TKIs, actually cytopenias are, are really very common. Um, but, but I think it's really important to make sure that the cytopenias are due to suppression of the BCR evil positive clone due to TKI while we await recovery of their normal hemopoiesis and is not due to sort of rapidly accelerating um, progression to um, blast phase, which it sounds like has been the case here, unfortunately. Um, there seems to be a sort of smoldering blast crisis almost in that the patient's not had optimal treatment because of their cytopenias and poor compliance over a couple of years, but they're still 
you know they're, they're obviously still alive and they're still having some treatment so, so I, I wondered if the patient still had blasts above 30 percent or if they were now in a second chronic phase i saw that their b cerebral percentage had dropped down to i think 7.8 percent or something i think the uh, we're not finding blasts in the peripheral smear so I'll, unless i do a marrow i will not be able to demonstrate the blast uh, but uh, having said that uh, um, uh, yes, uh, they do survive. I don't know why they survive uh, with some treatment, sometimes without any treatment whatsoever. They do survive, yet their uh, marrow seems to be in persistent blast crisis, unresponsive to the TKI at the dose which we are using. Or, uh, that's for sure. Yes, BCR level is low. I fully agree. So doesn't seem to reflect what is in the marrow. So I I guess for this patient, it would be worth repeating a marrow. I think my thoughts on treatment would be similar to the last patient. I think they're going to struggle with full dose of any TKI. And I do wonder with the cytopenias and the myelofibrosis, whether or not, given all the caveats we've just discussed in terms of ability to tolerate a transplant, ability to comply with the immunosuppression or the financial pressures of a transplant that this patient isn't also heading for a transplant as their definitive therapy. Charlie, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. What, what was the interval to blast crisis from, from March 2020? When, when was the blast crisis detected? Was it less than a uh, year, for example? Yeah, it's about a year from the start of the treatment. Yeah, might have been interesting to see whether the original marrow had cytogenetic changes already, in addition to the uh, to the Philadelphia chromosome. In in terms of normal circumstances, you certainly can get um, cytopenias even even with imatinib uh, because of uh, variable rate of recovery of uh, normal hematopoiesis. But in general, very few patients, uh, you, you can get almost all patients through it, um, occasionally stopping with judicious um, dose reduction and, and careful follow-up. I have colleagues who like to use growth factors in this situation. Uh, I must say I've never used EPO or amyloid growth factors. Uh, and it, it, there are occasional stubborn patients in whom the cytopenias um, are the major persistent limitation. And people, many of those patients, simply need lower doses. You know, the fact of the matter is we probably overdose many of our patients in terms of. Uh, what the effective dose could be um, to, to achieve long-term response. The evidence for that is best with the satinib because those nice studies from the Andy Anderson have shown that um, using 50 milligrams produces response rates just as good as 100 uh, with uh, much fewer, uh, much less toxicity. In, in terms of um, when she uh, had uh, either bad accelerated phase or just into myeloid blast crisis, we would have evaluated her for transplant at, uh, at that time. The, let's say she really had blast crisis, let's make this 40, 50%. Then the question often arises whether you try to control that simply with a second or third generation TKI um, or add chemotherapy. Uh, to that, uh, the AML type the chemotherapy. I think in patients in fluorid blast crisis with high blast counts and cytopenias, our approach has been to add um, AML type therapy to a TKI. I think with per 30% blasts, a switch to, uh, I guess he used the satinib, was very reasonable. Um, and you started at 100, and I think I probably would have started uh, at uh, approximately the, the same dose. 
in terms of the rest of her progress, she um, is behaving much more like accelerated phase than Frank Blass crisis to be alive uh, this long without progression on relatively modest um, therapy. But again, um, th this is someone who will need a transplant uh, to uh, have any possibility of a cure. It, it would be very unlikely that uh, you could achieve long-term uh, response with uh, a TKI. Uh, if she was here and we had penatinib or a synonym, uh, we would try it um, to, to prepare a patient for transplant and perhaps not do a transplant if, if there was an unexpected magical uh, molecular response. But I think you have to anticipate that the only curative therapy here is going to be transplant. Hamant and then Rago. Thank you. I think uh, all of us who would treat large number of patients of CML, say about 5% of the patients we encounter, they don't tolerate the full dose of the TKI. And if you reduce the dose, say give 200 milligrams of imatinib, and in my cohort of patients, I have one patient who is on 100 milligrams of imatinib. These patients still do very well. Uh, they do achieve a complete molecular response to reduce dose of TKI also. And my feeling is that these patients are, you know, slow metabolizers. They metabolize the TKI slowly. And these are the candidates in which uh, uh, doing a serum imatinib level uh, and deciding whether it is adequate or not might be appropriate. Uh, I'm not talking about this particular patient who did particularly bad, but some patients are there who, you know, just you just cannot give them the full dose of the TKI. And they do uh, well hematologically as well as molecularly. So probably they maintain an adequate level, serum level of hematinib, even with a, even with a lower dose. Back to Raghav. Uh, I, I sometimes get a lingering doubt whether it was a pure CML CP to start with. Uh, for, uh, did we, as uh, rightly pointed out uh, by Professor Copland, uh, did we miss uh, a blast in the marrow initially. It doesn't look like that. Uh, why is it that the BCR rebel and the marrow are not correlating with each other? I, I fully agree that we will repeat the marrow in her to see what the blast percentage now. Um, I sometimes wonder whether uh, it's a CML going into myelofibrosis or myelofibrosis manifesting sometimes uh, very strangely, as uh, as you can see in the second month of uh, starting itself, we had a uh, in the, within six months of starting as a CML chronic phase, we had a, a myeloid uh, blast crisis. So was it a, a terminal event of uh, a primary myelofibrosis ending up as a, a, a an acute leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia? Is that a possibility, or is it purely CML. I don't. I don't worry about the treatment part of it, but I just have a feeling that uh, these low PCR levels sometimes keep me worried. Charlie, what do you think? I don't know. I think we're missing a little information in terms of being able to answer that question. That is the cytogenetics um, uh, at, at the. Uh, time of diagnosis and uh, subsequently. Um, the distinction between myelofibrosis and uh, myeloid blast crisis, you know, if you have someone who presents with apparent straightforward myelofibrosis, the first thing you do is a BCR, well, maybe not the first, but one of the first things you do is a BCR able. Um, people with myelofibrosis uh, and who are Philadelphia chromosome positive, uh, it are ones who can have more difficulty in terms of uh, of count suppression um, with with TKI uh, therapy, um, but the issue in, in this um, person is you probably have persistent blasts. She needs a marrow to to document that, 
And uh, because the patient is young, uh, you have to think of what could represent a curative option. And, uh, and, and I think in this circumstance, that's very likely to be um, uh, only transplant. I, I, I'd just like to reiterate the, the uh, comments that were made about reduced dosages. Um, patients, you know, when you read the literature sometimes, it's almost like you get chastised for not uh, maintaining full dose. Um, but as was mentioned, there are some patients who do um, perfectly well in terms of molecular bond set, uh, lower dose. Um, whether this is a, a function of the biology of their particular CML or um, pharmacokinetic uh, considerations, I'm not sure, but it happens often enough so um, that you don't feel guilty if you have a great response on 200 milligrams of uh, nematinib. You've saved a lot of money, a lot of side effects, and um, it, it happens not uncommonly. Sorry, I, think I think dose optimization is really important. Um, and I, I would say probably about half our patients are not on the sort of maximum dose of their TKI. They're, they're on a sort of slightly adjusted dose to either be respectful of comorbidities or because they've had side effects on treatment. And, and we sort of try and balance the dose against their BCR able level and their side effects and comorbidities. And I, I think increasingly that's a really important option for patients rather than sort of switching, serially switching TKIs, um, but keeping them at maximal dose. You know, I think there are very few, if any, papers that address the simple question of what dose of drug, first or second generation, are, are people on um, long term? And and the answer is going to be about what you said. But a high fraction of patients are doing very well with lower than the quote optimal dose. But uh, it would might be nice if someone wrote that straightforward paper uh, just to to show those data. There's a task for someone after this uh, discussion. Raghu, are you fine for us to move on to Wonderful. the next case? Thank you. Thank you so much for all your insights. Thank okay. you. We shall, we shall move on.